year. One of my favorite studies on this is from Matt Brunig at the People's Policy Project, where he talks about how the white-black white, wealth gap, and this is why looking at things by race isn't always necessarily the best way to do it, is almost entirely a difference in the wage gap between- I wanna run back, I wanna run back just a little bit, cause see how he switched from wealth gap, from wage gap to wealth gap, and Saga does this shit all the time, I catch him. Like, I don't miss shit. Yeah, I've talked about this a lot here. One of my favorite studies on this is from Matt Brunig at the People's Policy Project, where he talks about how the white-black white, wealth gap, and this is why looking at things by race isn't always necessarily the best way to do it, is almost entirely a difference in the wage gap between the top 10% of whites and the top 10% of blacks. And with... Well, <laughs> let's see, shall we? Because Sagar is full of shit, and that is bullshit. So give me a second to pull up this chart. Let me see if well, I have easy why, access. Why Go ahead, John. Chart, I'm about to just, just say that Saga is really, he, he's a white dude. Like, to me, like, he's a real, he's an upper middle class, uh, weird kind of liberal, right wing, anti-black. Like, it's, it's been like, but he's like an upper middle class kind of business white dude and shit. With a Clark Clint haircut. He look like, he like a brown Superman. Like, it's no fucking, it's crazy, like. And like they often bring him on, like real shit as the face of the person of color to talk shit about black people. Like, I mean, like That's we can it. talk about Saga all day, like, but this is what he does, though. <laughs> Go ahead, sis. No, I'm still I'm still pulling up this thing. I might have to pull it up on my um I might have to pull it up on my um on my laptop, but I would rather do it on the computer so I don't show y'all something y'all don't need to see. Like, what's going on with Saga? Like, you need no more than us, bro. Yeah, yeah, this is the thing. And if um if anybody ends up clicking my podcast, like we're we're moving on now to like we're gonna do reparations episodes, but most of what I've been doing the past couple of months, I've been talking about like the Hindu nationalism in India because it's actually a pretty major deal. Um it's you know, I care a lot about like Islamophobia and stuff, like just had a lot of friends in the wars and stuff. So I just I really got into Islam for a lot of the two thousands. So um, you know, India is very Islamophobic. There's a lot of nationalism going there, and um the diaspora sends a lot of money. India is the number one country recipient of remittances. Um, and I, I, it's funny, um, a lot of the reparations arguments um, sometimes will mention that, you know, like the, a lot of this money goes out of the country. So India is, it gets uh, uh, multiple billions of dollars. And um, America has the highest earning Indian, America, Indian demographic of the diaspora in the world. So like what happened in the 1970s is that, um, you know, the and, you know, I'm, I'm speaking, you know, I have a podcast, I've interviewed a lot of people, I'm not like an India expert, but I'll definitely give you my take, like there's religion, there's culture, but there's caste and is really unique and people have really liked, especially I don't, I don't like Isabel Wilkerson's book. I mean, it's cool, but like a lot of people try to insert I caste. Well, I, I like the concept, but a lot of people like to insert caste into the American perspective and like they've been doing it for a long time in sociology. I definitely get what they're trying to do, but it is a very deep thing in India, it's not as like, there's a, it's a thousand year thing. So it's almost very difficult to impose it. But like, so what happened in the, in the 1970s is their prime minister, um, basically uh, she declared an emergency, which meant like, like martial law, civil rights. Like this is like, you know, third world nation went through a lot of shit in the sixties and seventies, just coming out of colonialism, trying to build a country and the West is sitting there like, ha ha, what are you doing? Like, what, like at any moment they're ready to write an article about how India is fucking up. So like they had some riots and stuff. So she was, she was known as the iron woman. She was kind of a socialisty third world leader. It was very popular in the time that a third wave um, Africa India partnership during the Cold War. Very interesting history. Uh, we don't, you know, South, South Asia, very interesting region. You know, they, they really did a, a beautiful democracy there. But in the 70s, she had to declare martial law for a couple of years. So basically, most of the upper caste, which would suffer most from the martial law, they fled over to America. So because of that, now I don't. I don't want this to come off like the wrong way, but you could look this up yourself because of this. I'm not trying to generalize. Most Indian Americans in America are part of that upper caste clue. And the ones that you see now are the second generation that came in the 70s. So these 70s upper caste people came with insane amounts of wealth because after India declared independence, it didn't go the way of China, like land reform and giving land. It didn't go the way of certain African nations, like more of a, um, I would maybe authoritarian rule. It went towards a democratic a deal and Prime Minister Nehru made a deal with the upper caste, with the landowners, with the wealthy. So, you know, uh, the peasants didn't really... That's why people in India, still two thirds of them are living on two dollars a day. 
you know, so it's like the upper caste got out really well. So for 30 years, they were all right. So in the 1970s, all the upper caste really came to America, most of them, Canada, things like that. So their kids are now Sagar's age. So I don't want to generalize, but I'm just telling you, a lot of these commentators you see, Zai Jelani, Sagar, and Jetty, again, don't take this the wrong way. A lot of the Indian commentators you see, they're not representative of what a, a Dalit would be in America, which in the 70s, the Dalit Panthers were a thing in India. They were with the Black Panthers. So the Dalit and the Black struggle, a Dalit is an oppressed um, Indian, a Dalit, which is a low caste Indian, an untouchable. You know, but what you see in America is mostly upper caste. Um, you can tell, like, you know, you guys know light skin versus like there's a skin element there, but there's also a last name. His last name in Jay is a very upper caste name. Indians will know this. Um, so there's a lot going on there that and Americans, what I found in my podcast covering this, Americans really don't know any of this the mm -hmm. past 20 years we've been really focusing on bombing the middle east i get it but um we're starting to learn about china now but you know there's a lot of culture in the subcontinent so i i'm glad i've been able to talk about that i i respect um you know the country and the culture of india and pakistan it's a really fascinating place as a revolutionary nation it doesn't really get a lot of credit um and it's a big, and there's 1.5 billion people in the country and they, they pulled it off, you know, thousands of languages. Like you talk about multiculturalism and, you know, they, um, a lot of those indentured servants came in Latin America as well. And, you know, when, when the Britain freed, Britain freed the black slaves in the 1830s, right? Because they were too, um, too revolutionary. So they brought over the docile Indians. So, I mean, the Indians were basically slaves in Latin America. So, I mean, these, those were the Indians we want to talk about, the Dalits, you know, those are, but what mostly gets platformed in America and who writes the articles and stuff are upper caste India and the Hindu America Foundation, which is their big advocacy group. They're basically an upper caste group and they defend the nationalist government in India. So there's a lot of weird things. If you guys listening have any Indian friends or stuff, you could ask them about Hindu nationalism. They'll probably give you a multi-hour rant as well, because it's a very deep and it's, um, it's very and the diaspora is very powerful. So um, I, I wouldn't trust a lot of what he has to say on race and stuff, because the upper caste of India really is it's an oppressor. It's an oppressive group. I mean, it's a thousand year uh, oppressive group. And like white people like myself, there's a lot of kind of that white fragility, white guilt. When you ask them about the caste system, the, the, the retort will be to blame the British, you know, blame colonialism. There is an argument there. Blame the Muslims. Um, a lot of them will say like caste doesn't exist none of this is so like white people like the plantation owners after civil war they will you know deflect and things like this so i think a lot of people see brown and they think oppressed but they don't realize yes. that like cubans and haitians are different you know like upper caste indians are very different from dalits and if more people saw them as an oppressed group but as a white person this is a very difficult conversation for me to have i'm trying to word it so carefully my heart's racing i'm walking on eggshells because man, commenting, shit, man. You are, you are commenting on a brown it's it's shit, or dark, it's it's just weird now man it's weird so that's the end of my rant i, I hope it helped a little bit but no i think that was very informative i tried yeah so thank you appreciate that man. Yeah.